it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, you everyone to Bill Powers. Um, Bill Powers will be joining us today for um, our second or third, I can't remember, let's see, check, so this is a more conversational format that we have uh, in lieu of our regular seminar series. Um, I met Bill uh, during, uh, I think in 2014 or yeah. 15. So when I first moved to MIT, uh, my often office happened to be right next to his, um, just by pure coincidence. And this is how we started talking. And then I learned like many other people um, at the media lab, which is where I was before moving here. Uh, Bill comes from an eclectic background, so he started off as a journalist to graduate from Harvard. He worked in uh, journalism and international uh, relations, would you say, or what would you call it? Initially in the in the U.S. Senate foreign policy, mm -hmm. and then journalism at the Washington Post. Yeah. Yes, and then after the after working in journalism for many years, uh, moved to tech. Because I wrote a book that sort of took me into. That's right. So the, the, the most, I think the, the kind of, well, the most interesting things he did, he did lots of interesting things. One of the most interesting things he did is writing a book that later became a New York Times bestseller. It's called the Hamlet's Blackberry. And it was about how we get lost in our devices and how we battle to regain our time uh, from those devices. And this is way before this was like a thing. Um, and I think you, um, you coined the term as well. The book kind of caught on. Yeah, internet sabbath or digital sabbatical. Digital yeah. sabbatical. Yeah. I yeah. think it's uh, which I think I advise all of you, including myself, to, to do. Um, and then after that, Bill um, uh, moved. So in part because of this book, uh, became sort of like a thought leader in how we can balance our digital lives with our humanistic mm -hmm. uh, tendencies. Um, and and values, and then moved and worked in tech and started getting involved in the new emerging kind of data science, using data science to understand the public sphere, um, and working with technologists who really know a lot about technology but don't understand perhaps the way the public sphere works. Um, and through that, during his time at MIT, he worked on a fascinating project that he will talk to us about today. Um, and which then led to the most recent uh, kind of initiative that he started as, as a foundation. So, as a nonprofit. So, um, thank you all for joining us. And I would like to kick start perhaps by um, asking Bill to uh, just a very general question. But from as a person with training in the humanities, how did you find yourself here? Like, what's, what attracted you to technology? Well, it's funny because my book, Hamless Blackberry, was sort of about a little bit about being repelled by technology, or at least how it was taking over my mind, my family life. I had a young child at the time who was, was getting addicted to the screens like we were. And so I sort of wrote it out of that, although I'm very much an optimist about society, and I did feel this will wind up in a good place. And the book is about looking back at seven previous really big tech moments in history where people were all panicked and feeling oppressed by technology and so forth. And then I kind of tell the story of how they figured out how to make it more human, how to make it work. So I figured that would happen again. Maybe I could help with the book. So anyway, some people at MIT noticed the book and I was invited to do a kind of a nonprofit startup with a for-profit startup, like within this analytics company's work. They said, is there anything we can do with our data, which was Twitter data that they were selling to companies, analytics, anything we can do like for society? This is 2012, early 2012. And I came from, I was originally from Washington, D.C., you know, had worked there in journalism. And I said, well, there's a big election this year, 2012. Maybe we could listen to the public on Twitter and put a blog up where we use the analytics, the analytics talk about the election. So. They loved the idea. The CEO, Deb Roy, who was an MIT professor, loved the idea. So we started doing it. We built this very modest kind of analytics machine within the machine to do that. And uh, my friends in journalism, though, in Washington and New York were kind of laughing at me. And they were like, Twitter has nothing to do with politics. You know, I don't know what you're doing. But 
my feeling was suddenly everybody had a public voice and Twitter was different from Facebook because Facebook is closed, you know, all these little worlds within it, but Twitter was open. And I sort of felt like, wow, this is like a new public square. Let's see what we can hear. So we did that project. It got some attention. And then everybody went back to the media lab and he invited me to join his research group. And we did all kinds of different projects. I don't know if any of you heard about that little town in Spain that was using Twitter to run the whole town some years ago. It was called Tulum. and it's a town. We went and visited that town to see how they did that. Um, but then we did this project that he uh, referred to, which is as the next election approached, 2016, before we knew who were the final candidates in the US, we said, let's do that again, but really at scale. Let's take Jack Dorsey gave us all of Twitter for free, every possible thing he could give us, we had, which was great. And um, we just started tracking the election conversation starting a year before, every day, millions and millions of tweets. And as it got further along and it got finally down to two candidates, Clinton and Trump, we had isolated not just these conversations, narratives about all these different important topics, but also populations of people with different tendencies, including huge numbers of people who seem to be very likely Clinton voters and huge numbers who seem to be very likely Trump voters, partly because they had, had only followed that one candidate from the beginning, called them um, exclusive followers of Clinton and Trump. So we started doing articles with the Washington Post and CNN and other news outlets just saying, here's what Twitter's saying. And we weren't pretending Twitter represented the American public because it doesn't, it didn't and it doesn't. But it was a public square that we were tracking and it had a lot of media people in it who suddenly were being converted to this being a place where politics does matter. And we got a lot of attention for it and we wound up at the last four presidential debates as the, as the first ever tech team participating in the debates in an official role. We were giving questions to the moderators debates were Clinton versus Trump, questions based on our analytics. So people on Twitter were concerned about this question, what do you, Clinton, and you, Trump, think about that? Which was amazing to be there. And I have a few slides from, from that in this deck. And um, now, years later, with polarization in the air and a lot of feeling in the US that democracy is kind of threatened because people are only hearing ideas like their own and we're all isolated, we thought, Two friends and I thought that it might be time to reboot this as a nonprofit and get all the Twitter data again, which you can buy basically, and start listening to all the voices and share them as a new way of tracking public opinion. So that's what Public Mind is. That's our organization. Would you like to take us through some of the slides to yeah. so people can sort of see what this all looks yeah. like, what the project looks like? Yeah, absolutely. It's a short deck. Um, so this is the kind of the assumption that we're basing the whole idea on of this startup, which is that democracy depends on a healthy public sphere. We did some work at the, that group at MIT, which was Iyad's neighbor, but was not the same group that Iyad was in, um, around kind of the history of the public sphere. So you can see kind of ancient Rome or something there. And then this is probably the coffee houses of London in the 17th century that the German philosopher Habermas has written about. Um, maybe as the birth of one kind of public sphere. And then this is theoretically today's public square, people online. And this is where the future of society is debated and shaped. And this is what we are. Oh, yeah. This is what we're addressing with the startup, which we call public mind. Public mind is an old phrase in English, and particularly in the United States, it was used by the people who founded our country in the 1700s a lot. It was used somewhat in the 1800s, and then in the middle of the 20th century, it had a fashionable period where people talked about the public mind in the age of TV or whatever. Um, but it had kind of faded out, and we realized we could get it as a name, like trademark it, because nobody was really using it. And so our lawyers did that, and so we're calling ourselves public mind, and this is our mission, mapping the voices of modern democracy. And the goals are to elevate citizen voices and reinvigorate public discourse for a healthier, more truly democratic society. And by healthier, we mean there that we all are hearing all the voices on some level with the help of algorithms. 
sort of what polls used to do. You know, we had George Gallup, this American who sort of invented scientific polling in the 1930s. Interestingly, just as fascism was on the rise um, in different parts of the world. And he did a wonderful service to the United States and the world because we could get these regular reports from him on what pollsters were finding. Pollsters, polls don't work anymore for various reasons. They're kind of broken. Maybe they'll be fixed. But we feel like we could step in with this new view of people speaking up in their own voices, generating a comprehensive, real-time picture of public opinions, reconnect citizen voices to the people who need to hear them in the news, politics and power centers and people who are trying to fix problems in society. And it might lead to rethinking some of these technologies like social media so they work better than they currently do. Stop me if you have any questions. Go ahead. And so this, we park it back. This is the thing we built at MIT. It was called the Electome. That is a still picture of like one of the visualizations of the data. The click here is for a seven minute video that we don't really have time to watch, but any of you are interested, I can send you the link to it. It just tells the story of that project. Um, and then this is an example of one of many, many, many hundreds of things we did during that year with our data. This is a Washington Post piece. You may remember there had been a terrible um, attack on a disco in Florida um, that was an LGBT kind of bar. And this guy with all these guns killed all these people. And we had by this time isolated the Clinton people on Twitter and the Trump, Trump likely people. And we showed that they interpreted this news event in different ways based on their political views. So the Clinton people talked about it as being all about guns being too, being too easy to get and about LGBT people being oppressed and, and hunted down. And Trump followers interpreted it as, oh, terrorism and immigration fear and a fear issue. Uh, this is another visualization that was a different thing where it showed a moment of conversation rising when Trump talked about gun rights to mobilize people against Clinton. And you can see all these other issues on the side that we were tracking and color coding within that graph. The, the, the visualizations were really kind of nerdy, as you can see from this. And we did find that when normal people who don't know much about data looked at them, sometimes they were not sure how to read it. So with our new startup, we're going to work on that and try and make the visualizations more accessible. So then we were invited to the debates. As I said, this was the debate that I was at. Um, and the moderators, you can see them right down in front. And we literally had given them suggested questions from our data for the two candidates. This is my colleague, Saroosh Wasohi, who's now a professor at Dartmouth, uh, but he was a postdoc who was the chief scientist on the project. And we set up a table, and those are the journalists behind him. There are actually thousands of journalists at the debate. And we went around like trying to sell journalists to use, and some of them did. Um, but again, some of them looked at the screen and were like, I'm on deadline, I can't really learn how to use that. Um, so that was an important lesson. Um, Not happening again. In the middle of it. Okay. Okay. Then this is me um, at that same debate, kind of selling the, the idea to this journalist. I don't even remember who it was, but he was one of the journalists there, and I was showing him, showing him what we had. And then, so stepping back now to what we're doing now, this is very simple visualization of how the machine will work. Public discourse goes in. We use algorithms to isolate the different topics or groups of people or whatever. In this case, I have two topics that are very big right now that we would isolate. And then outputs would include public discourse analysis that's kind of a journalism product, sort of a new category of journalism we're trying, we're hoping to define. Measuring public opinion, sentiment, narratives, rising and falling, et cetera. Reports, news stories, data viz, podcasts for the public. And ultimately, we've, we'd like to build, this is a big aspiration, but you all know what a Bloomberg terminal is that tracks financial markets. At least that's what we call it in the US. Um, so we're imagining something like that for the public square, for the digital public square. You could tune in to topics and conversation anytime you want and see what the latest measurements are, where things are headed. And then this is an example of how 
our work could turn into news. So one topic would be the January 6th insurrection. It's now such a big deal in the United States for democracy and various questions you could answer. The vaccine issue during COVID. Uh, there was good work done on that about social media, but not as, as good as it could have been. And I think we could help there. And then, then of course, climate change is this essential topic that we feel we could really surface the public views on. And this is a very complicated slide, but it basically shows our theory of change. And we do want to try and change how things work in with public media becoming more useful to us, where you have basically at the top elevating citizen voices and reinvigorating public discourse. And through these various processes with government, news media, et cetera, you wind up with a, with a fuller view of the digital public square. And therefore, because we're hearing all the voices, or as many of them as we can, it becomes more inclusive, vibrant, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. So maybe should we um, switch the screen or stop sharing? That we okay? Okay. Yeah. To... And I'm happy to talk about where we are as an organization. We're about to build the first version of the technology based on the old one, but much improved. Um, and we have MIT and Dartmouth as two co-founding academic partners. Uh, we might have a few others sign on because our CTO came from a different university background. Uh, she's also a White House Innovation Fellow right now, so she's dividing her time between this White House Fellowship and working with us, which is exciting. So, so the few the few things that uh, thank you for the introduction and the overview. Um, I think. It's a really important uh, tool, um, and I think the problem that you're trying to address is really, really important and very difficult to solve. And I'm trying to kind of position the, maybe just by probing to position your objective and maybe something we can learn about the scientists as well about what's important to study. You spoke about, you know, the overall mission or the objective is to elevate voices, and you could sort of change one letter there and you make it elevate noises. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of impression, at least like anecdotal, you know, it's part of our culture as we say, look, social media is mostly noise. So, um, so how, mu how, how much do you think is a, there is a voice versus just pure noise and people just attacking each other kind of with nonsense on social media? In other words, how much attention should we pay uh, to this information? And in what way? Because ultimately, I mean, these voices shape shape opinion. They shape each other. Right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of dynamic conversation. Yeah, it's a great question. So Twitter, Twitter analytics right now, I think everybody who's doing it is pretty crude. It almost has to be crude in a way, in certain ways, because the volume is so massive every day, and there is a lot of noise. But you can develop tools to cut through the noise. And we had two very basic ones, but they worked in that project. One was um, having these topics that we isolated every day. And we isolated them initially by inputting very basic terms that the machine would use to start to learn about that particular topic. And then the machine was built so that it would report to us every week a new terms it was learning, new phrases, that seemed like they were also a part of that conversation, but it would ask us for approval. Like it would give us a list and we could say, yes, include that, yes, include that. But sometimes they would be completely wrong, obviously, because machines don't know. So, so that's one tool. Another tool we, we realized early on before anyone talked about Russian bots that we had a lot of bots in the data. So we just by human inspection. So we created a bot detector, Sarush, who I showed, built this bot detector. And it really was incredibly effective. When the Russian bot story came out after the election, we looked back at our data and it was really clean. We didn't have the Russian bots changing our measurements of these different topics because we had got most of them out, not all of them, but most of them. So those are two examples of getting the noise out. I think there's others. There's also proactive things that one might be able to do. I'm not saying we're going to do this, but you could do a kind of a George Gallup thing on Twitter where you isolate representative, you know, samples of the public and maybe get those people permission, people's permission 
to be tracking them, something like that. I don't know if Twitter would allow that, but it's a lot of people. There's lots of ways you can reach out and say, hey, let's follow this group. They're interesting and they represent. So those are some examples. I, I, it gives me this uh, follow-up question, which is, I guess it's about what opinions matter, right? Like we talk about this. So first of all, we say that the opinions of bots shouldn't matter. I think for the time being, at least. Uh, maybe one day the bots will matter. Uh, but then, for, so for now, we want, we're interested in the voices of humans. And now within this group, humans, there's also a variety of voices. I mean, there's people who are not on particular social media platforms that you're studying. You mentioned that, that uh, the, the platform is not representative. So it's not voting, right? It's, it's different from, you know, one person, one vote, which is kind of it puts everybody on equal footing. Like, you know, it doesn't matter your education level or your age or whatnot. You always, you know, every person has one vote and that's how the system works. But this is kind of different because here your argumentative skills, your noise making skills, your maybe ability to mobilize others is also matters. So my question is, how do you see the role of the public? This is a very general question, I, I realize. The role of this kind of public debate and uh, let's say our and our quantification of that public debate i mean it has a role among its members like people are talking to each other and learning from each other maybe once in a while changing their mind but as an observer of this what do you get out of it that's different from polls and votes right and and are they is it the replacement of votes is it the replacement of, can it be in replacement of voting you know, in theory, is it a replacement of polling or is it a completely different category that complements them? I think it's a different category that hasn't been defined yet. And I want to underline, this is not a machine about Twitter. We're starting with Twitter because we know how to do that. But our our main funder, which is Schmidt Futures, Eric and Wendy Schmidt's fund, um, really urged us from the beginning a year ago to when they came on board to have the ambition of adding other platforms quickly, other languages and other countries quickly. And I was in Spain last week giving a few talks about public mind and I would like Spanish to be the second language, partly because um, it's one of the top four languages in the world. It's big in the United States and I speak Spanish. I have a lot of connections in that world. So I was speaking with folks about that and they were saying, you know, well, Twitter, great, but you know, we're on other platforms too. And that's our goal. Now I don't, we haven't even explored access to data, buying data, there's gonna be some data we will never get. Facebook's very hard to work with famously, notoriously. But we're gonna start with Twitter and I feel if we do a really great job, other platforms might wanna be included. If we're tracking the public mind and people are paying attention to that, I could see platforms saying, hey, can we give you some, maybe it would be anonymized, who knows? So then the thrust of your question was about how do we measure public opinion when there's all these kind of hard to really isolate and quantify ways that people get noticed or get heard, right? I guess the question is about what do we do with this information? Right. So now that we get, you know, the quotes, we know that somebody wins, somebody loses, we try to change, yeah. you know, the transition of power. And that's the end of it. The it's like I don't know the way you know somebody used the term that some analogy that democracy is kind of simulated warfare. You know, so instead of instead of saying you know, fighting to 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 overthrow power and all the people that will die in the mm -hmm. process, let's let's see who has more fighters, yeah, yeah. potential fighters, and let's just simulate this warfare and say, okay, there's more more people here than here. Yeah. Then let's do as as much as should like. Now, so if if voting is like simulated warfare, then the kind of the online discussion, this public sphere, to use the term from Habermas, the, it's the the skirmishes, right? Like it's the mm -hmm. or it's the preparation, right? Or or something like that. So so as what do we learn from that? Well, first of all, although this was born from an election project. We don't view it as an election project, and we don't actually view it as a winners losers idea. We view it more analogous to polls, which is, of course, polls often had yes or no questions, which we can't really do unless we do a poll on a social platform. But 
But like, for example, let's take the um, pandemic and vaccine question that we've all been through right in the last few years. So there was some good data analytics work on that, but there was a lot deeper work that could have been done about the diff all the different narratives and the languages people were using. And in terms of winning or losing, which narratives were rising, which narratives were falling among the anti-vaxxers against the pro-vaxxers, we think that that would be super valuable for society to know week in and week out. Here's kind of what that narrative looks like. Now, here's this other narrative over here that's about, for example, in the United States, guns being so on the present and children being killed by them practically every week. Um, what are all the narratives around that? And also, another interesting question is um, how people's beliefs change because they're part of these conversations. You could track groups of people and see how their own language and seemingly, you know, opinions are changing without ever reaching out to them because it's all spontaneous, right, and unprompted. So that's a downside, but also a an upside because it's in the wild and it's people yeah. actually living their lives and talking about these things. Okay, so so <clears throat> let me see if I can answer my own question with what you just said. Yeah. So, so if I understand, so one way of thinking about it is that. Uh, what you do with the bot botting call, uh, the botting box station is when I mean, you're kind of adjusting policy by you know removing a whole group of people, putting a whole new group, and then things change. So that's kind of like a very long cycle of change, right? And if you want to do shorter cycles of change, like you want to design like more higher resolution policy changes, or you can't just wait. And, and, and what, you know, at whatever time scale you want to do it, you want to know what are people concerned about now, and you can re react potentially within the space of months or weeks or even mm -hmm. shorter within days. And for this kind of decision making, instead of just building it on, on assumption, it would be useful to know what people are going through already, not just in their yeah. you know, behavior, but also in their right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's. One of the challenges of our world that we live in, of democracy, which is that you want to know what the people are thinking. You want to hear everybody in the public square, but social platforms don't allow that very easily right now. They're, they put us into these sort of containers of people that we agree with, a monthly or whatever you want to call it. And what was wonderful about the old physical public square was that you could walk in there and walk around and encounter all kinds of people. Sure, you'd have your friends you agreed with, but you knew other things were happening and it wasn't hidden from you, other opinions. And now they're trying to effectively conceal, and we think that's dangerous. Um, in Spain, one of the talks I gave in Spain, somebody said, you're talking about all these people as your audience. You're talking about the media, you're talking about policymakers, you're talking about social change people, but who's your ultimate client? And I said, I've never been asked that before, but I instantly said, our ultimate client is democracy. We actually want democracy to be more functional because people are aware of not just their and their immediate like-minded people's opinions, but of opinion writ large. And therefore, people's opinions could evolve in new ways because of exposure to views different from theirs. And the United States and other democracies have had that for a long time, but it's really strange how it's fracturing now. And the public square is these little booths that we're in, and that seems dangerous. And our aim is to try and work on that. Okay, that, that brings up some interesting questions about um, the what are the mechanisms that lead to this kind of polarization and people kind of having conversations only among people who already agree with them. It seems to me, and it seems that the evidence is pointing in this direction that it's in part the algorithms are sort of providing us with what we're already seeking. You know, we already seek people who are like minded because, you know, it's easier, they agree with us. And once in a while, we want people who disagree with us, maybe only to win an argument over them mm -hmm. rather than to really be convinced otherwise. To, you know, to the extent that there was some really cool study. Uh, showing how exposure to opposing views can amplify polarization in some cases. So, um, because you just, you know, the, the differences maybe get more um, salient. So, but what you're, but at the same time, having 
So I think I don't know how how to solve this problem. I think this this problem of like exposure, but I think perhaps if you have a good lens to measure the to, to see the whole landscape of opinion, and to see perhaps that some opinions are actually not as prevalent as people think, and that the majority is maybe more reasonable, mm -hmm. you can actually empower the reasonable parties by giving, you know, so this is one way, I don't know, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but like you, you know, let's suppose there are some, on the gun issue, there are people who are like very strong believers in gun rights, and they just want to take things all the way to the extreme, they don't want any regulation. And then if you could show that this is a very small minority, and most people are kind of more on the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they can be convinced, they're open to, to regulation, then you can get, get somewhere, right? So that's a situation where the, having the broad picture is very helpful. Yes, it's helpful, but we are not in the business. We're not going to be in the business of taking a side that we feel should be the one that gets promoted. We want to be a, like a clear lens on the public square and objectively report it. So, whatever my position on guns is, as a public mind CEO, I want us to hear what everybody's saying about guns and report it objectively, sort of like the way the best mainstream media used to report the news. And the influence they had, and that was kind of this place where people came together and heard it from a relatively objective perspective. I don't want to sound nostalgic because that time is not coming back, but I think there is a way to reveal this fractured public square more holistically so we can all realize, oh, well, there's actually more gradations of opinion than I realize. And it's not just that extreme person and that extreme person. There's all these other interesting things which we're not hearing because it's not the screamers, you know. And I think the non-screamers could be super valuable to bringing sanity back to the market. Okay, so that, that's an interesting question because then you you're, you describe the screamer. So I guess the screamer on social media corresponds to like a person who's um, posts a lot, perhaps, and more. Um, Maybe more content, more volume, um, and perhaps a different kind of uh, emotional. Yeah. And I guess what we're not going to we're not going to ignore that. <laughs> but there's a lot of other people who are being ignored who are not like. Right now. Okay. okay. So there's a kind of you're trying to kind of normalization of mm -hmm. some sort of like. Um, yeah. So that different. I guess I guess one of the things that the platforms provide is they give people disproportionate. I mean this. This seems to be a law of the universe, like the social world, is that spontaneously some people will have a, a strong, greater power at spreading messages, right? You know, through the connections to the hierarchy or whatever, whatever. Um, and that there's a way perhaps to kind of normalize for that. Like you yeah. Know. You said it better. Yeah. Than <laughs> and uh, in terms of, I guess one question is like, did, did you think about like what sort of interventions? Are possible like to improve because at the moment your the goal is to sense you know improve sensing right? it's mm -hmm. like measurement yeah. improve measurement and then once you have better measurement you can improve your interventions you can you know you can for example uh, interventions designed to make for a better com high quality conversation online we don't want to do that okay we don't want to be manipulating the conversation we really just want to be revealing so to the extent that we become activists in any direction, including that, or for scientific purposes to be manipulating, I mean, we could do studies, sure, where we do that, but just in terms of our large, you know, headline motives, it's not about that. And, you know, this is frankly a reason that we had a long time fundraising for this venture because Many of the philanthropic foundations we went to, they wanted us to be on their team. They're on for some cause. They would say the cause. And they would say, can you make the machine all about that? We had to keep saying no, because we didn't want to be on a mean team. And then we finally found some funders who liked that we were just trying to hear it. You mentioned for, uh, working by scientific projects. And so do you have plans to work on, with scientists? Yeah, yeah. In fact, we want to do the, we're now talking to, Several universities about um, doing the build of our first version of the technology with an academic team, and so those are ongoing. I did a call about it yesterday with one of them. So 
I want to get that going as soon as possible. I'm very impatient for this to get the machine running because it's an urgent societal issue. And we wanted to do it, our CTO wanted to do it with an academic team because she wants us to be really on the cutting edge of the science. The science matters. We, maybe we should open it to uh, Q and A because, uh, and just for context, like the the Center for Humans and Machines, we're interested in how technology is shaping, reshaping, improving, worsening uh, human society um, and human well-being. And for us, like studying social media is one of the important. I mean, it's one of the biggest technologies that have impacted our daily life and social interaction. Um, so we're very much interested in like all sorts of improvements and measurement. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, that's a huge part. I mean, maybe we yeah. could collaborate. Yeah. We'd yeah. like to open it up for other researchers here. Some of them are working on these topics that are very relevant to this. Andy? I and if, if I could ask you to repeat the question afterwards for the. I will. Yeah. So I just want to bring back to the streamers. First, you know, even if we have the stream group, streamers on one side, streamers on the other side, and then people who are like in the middle, but also mostly silent. So, you know, let's say if there is a silent majority, like the majority are basically silent, let's say, then they're likely to. to to read about things and to say things is, is less than the other people on the extreme, right? And their ideas are probably might be more nuanced. And more nuanced ideas are harder to spread. So it's also harder for people to, you know, it's less, less catchy as well. So, I mean, in this case, I mean, I know that you said, you know, you're not correct for these things, but like, how would you know, how would you know the proportion if one group is always present, they are better, Systematically, are better. Like the groups are systematically better than the one in the middle. Especially. Yeah, it's a very hard problem. I mean, most people on Twitter I know tweet very infrequently or not at all. Like it's a huge. I don't know if it's most, but it's a very large percentage of people that are infrequent tweeters, and then quite a few of them are just silent just listeners. Um, so that's bad for us, obviously. Um, however, if Twitter begins and other platforms begin to you put to a use where an effort is being made to hear all kinds of people and people who aren't necessarily using the most extreme language, you know, using attention getting, you know, boys of various kinds, um, or very ideological people. If 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 there's a listening going on for a broader range of people, we're thinking that that might encourage more people to speak up on platforms. Now, I don't know that we could get involved with that with one of these platforms. Maybe we could do a project where we try and increase the number of people that are speaking up who feel comfortable speaking up and not afraid of being tamped down or denounced because they're not like, you know, there is this kind of herd thing that happens on these platforms. As you know, we start using all the same language as the other people in your bubble. And so, you know, it's a very grandiose vision I'm having that we could have an effect on that. but. Somebody's got to try. Um, you know, what in the early days of polling, it seemed like people were really doubting George Gallup was doing, like going door to door and talking to people at their front door and asking them these certain questions and then claiming that was saying something about the public. But it was. It really was. It really worked for a long time. It's not working currently. And I think that's a similar, we're kind of at this frontier, which we have not figured out questions like that, but we want to. Yeah, thanks so much. This was really, really inspiring. So, the terminology you used to like public mind is not inspiring me to think about it in a sort of psychotherapeutic view. And I asked the question like, do you think public mind has five bullets? <laughs> and the way that you identify by bullets, what are people is what's called mood charting. And so, you really chart what the mood is. Just it. Right. And I feel like you're kind of doing that for Twitter. If you're charting that is around, and then when you go into treatment of five blood spray, you would give, for example, you say a lot. And I just wonder if there's any equivalent that you think of. I know that you don't want to tinker with it too much, but I mean, could you see something that would just help to kind of, you know, stabilize the little bit so that they don't put the extreme thing? 
I don't think we want to be stabilizing views and taking the, you know, like trying to influence even the volume at which people speak. We just want to hear more of the people, basically, like have more of the public mind revealed by really good listening and analytics. That's the goal. And you're, it's a great, and I haven't had anybody say that to me about bipolar, but of course, it's a different kind of polarity that we're talking about. We're talking about ideological polarity generally when you say that about social media, not emotional polarity, but it's major, it's, it's massive. I mean, it's one of the most frustrating things about it if you are someone worried about democracy today. And um, I think that it's something that we have to, try. as an organization and as a team, we're going to tr have to try to get to what else is there besides that stuff that's dominating now. Dominating because it's polarized, because it's very loud in certain ways. People have a right to be loud. They're succeeding at being heard. But as we said, a lot of people are not being heard. And I don't know the answer yet, but I think nobody, you know, these, these platforms themselves are so busy selling ads and doing all the stuff that keeps them afloat financially. I don't think they've worked very hard on these questions, and we're a nonprofit that hopefully will have the freedom to do that. I have a follow up question. Just a quick follow up yeah. question. So, maybe it's a challenging one point, though. It's like, how public should be published in the mm -hmm. sense that people are still quite anonymous? Do you think the policy of you know, your customer in a way is like that people would actually identify themselves in a different way? Do you actually be allowed? We'd have to make it more public in the sense that you have a reputation for the proceedings to be one of the reasons why people are shouting. So, so right. There's no real reputation at stake. So we view the public mind as a slightly different meaning from what you meant in that question, which is that the public mind is, is this thing that actually doesn't exist, but it's a metaphor for something, which is like the collective mind. So not the mind that is by definition public, but the mind of the public. And that's why it was used so long ago. I mean, as I said, philosophers and people who founded democracies in the 18th century used the phrase public mind, even though they had no access to it like we do. You know, it was just like who you met on the street, whatever, um, and or who, who, who had the power to write a newspaper column. So it was influencing the public mind, but it's diffuse. It's still diffuse, but in a different way where we do have data. And I feel like if we really are good technologists and scientists, we could do more with that data to talk about all the public mind and all its complexity. There is no one that you can't say this mind represents any of us individually, but if you're, if you're showing kind of the gradation of the public mind in the many rooms it contains, I think that could be really valuable. That's what we do. A question from Azar. I have one question because there was a research that they worked on Wikipedia, Wikipedia data set, but what they have done, they just for each topic, they go over the text related to that topic over the time, and then they provide a summarization and then show a very small copy, something like that. This is that you are going to do for Twitter, I mean, just for because you are going to make it visible. Yeah. But how? I mean, is that true? So you're saying this thing they did with Wikipedia, right? To help it more understandable. Yes, in a sense, that's a good analogy. What's different is that social media are growing and changing every day. And yeah. yeah, but so what we had to do is we had to solve the problem of early in our work on the electron project, we had to solve the problem of tweets. And for example, of tweets not Tweets having this shorthand language, and it, so we we took the whole concept of word to vec and made it tweet to vec, and that solved the problem. And we got a lot of accuracy from that. But people are always coming up with new ways to use tweets, and use the format, and so the machine would have to learn that. So not the same on Wikipedia, I think. And of course, every tweet tweet represents a different person, which is tricky. But over time, you also learn things about these people. Machine can begin to learn and there's other data about the people where they live and so forth. So I think all of that's useful. But it is a more complicated problem, I think, than the one you described. Yeah, fascinating, really fascinating. So I mean, 
seems like you're, you're kind of trying to aggregate the public uh, sphere, right, a space. And, and now, as you mentioned, also Twitter WAG. So, so how do you see the role of algorithms in this aggregation process? And, and do you feel like we, we can make some Euclidean um, average in the public space? I mean, if you say that you are able to map, is this possible to map reliable, like, like a, a public opinion into a, a clean space and they like, or what are the limitations of these approaches? So we're, we're not only getting very technical, we're getting above my technical level with that question. But if I had some of my colleagues here from particularly my CTO, I think I'd give you a better answer to the question. I think we're gonna try all kinds of mapping techniques that are obviously going to use a lot of math and a lot of mathematical techniques and at this moment, I don't know what they are. We have the ones from the electron. The electron was open source, which is nice. And so, since we're out of MIT now, we're able to use all of that. But the science has come a long way. And fortunately, our science colleagues have been with it as it moved forward. And I'm still brushing up on where it stands now. Um, Saroosh, the fellow at Dartmouth, um, is really involved in narrative science, um, which wasn't really a thing back then. And another thing that we weren't, we didn't use at all back then was sentiment detection, sentiment analysis. We were skeptical of it. And I have been convinced that that has made a lot of progress. So that's going to play a role as well, which will be very rich think, and add a whole level that we didn't have. Before. Just two examples. Yeah, then it's maybe, maybe we can start back at the bottom. Like, yeah. um, I mean, in, in what you showed, it was like kind of very broad topics, kind of, right? And what you're talking about that's actually a little bit like against what you're kind of arguing, right? Like bringing the world's natures onto the table because you're really like, okay, guns, LTBG, you know, like it's actually even more categorizing than, than maybe what was originally in the tweet. So, how do you feel like maybe there's a technology, like, like a new technology needed to really unveil this more nuanced? And more niche um, opinions, or like, is that a challenge for you? Or like... Yeah, it's a great challenge. It's an important challenge. I think that we have to start when you're doing topics. You have to start kind of crude and big, but the more you get into the nuances, it becomes more and more valuable because you're actually showing people the complexity of the world. And this is how I do. I use that phrase, um, public discourse analysis. We want to develop that as a kind of journalism. I think that could be a big role for the, for the public discourse analyst is getting at the nuances and telling the story of each of these crude topics so that it's more than crude, so that it's really showing you the world in its detail. And my, my guess is that, I mean, that the computer scientists are working on, you know, there's a whole field of topic modeling, a whole field of sentiment analysis, a whole field of network analysis. All of these things are you know, being pushed, I think. Understanding how to combine all of these things in a meaningful way so that they can inform a decision is for me non trivial. Like, you know, you could show that you beat the, the, the previous algorithm and like classifying sentiments, or I don't know, you generate topics that make more sense or something like this, but then, then you stop there, right? Like, then I think there's so many unanswered questions in the application of this technology in practice. I mean, you hit some of them when the journalist said, okay, I don't understand what this says. Like, what does this figure say? And then you, you end there, right? Like, and then you have to work on visualization, right? So you don't have to invent something every time, but it's just putting it all together. Self is, I think, yeah, would be an accomplishment. I do think as a writer, I do think there's not enough good, really nuanced writing about this category of data. And partly it's that it's so daunting. I think people kind of understandably shy away from it. But we're hoping to enable more of that by surfacing, not just the big broad topics, as I said, but a lot of the details and nuances in ways that make sense to people and where a journalist can do something explanatory that's very useful. You know. I've done before on that question because the kind of thing I suggest that there is no currently one best algorithm that will do that in the, in the most unbiased way, right? And the choice of which one you end up choosing in a way is kind of like choosing the different, you know, there might be different ways of summarizing the public. You have to choose one of those. Yeah, that's kind of because to make that's a 
very big deal <laughs> a choice and we haven't crossed that bridge yet we'll probably try a lot of different paths but i don't know where we we'll wind up but i think i just think that i imagine that there would be like lots, lots of different tools like different tools track different things and then you use whatever's best tool for the job i remember Sarush after he worked on the uh electron project he worked on like the spread of fake news and true news for that he had to build the, the kind of fake news to, to fake tweet qualif uh, classifiers mm -hmm. he had to, to to build this in the state of the art so that it's like accurate enough for the purposes that he needed uh, it for and then he published this science paper on the spread of fast or fake news being faster and wider than true news that was like a very specific question and then okay to answer this question i need this tool so I imagine this, there would be uh, not like, I don't imagine like one tool that picks, you know, gives you everything. I imagine like a kind of catalog of different tools that give you different perspectives on what's, what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I can give you an example. We were frustrated during the electron project that the so-called influencers that were being written about the media were these really obvious people who really were dominant in the conversation. And, we decided to do an experiment where we would try and find hidden influencers who were having a lot of influence for the relatively smaller sphere they were in. And so somehow the student I worked with on this developed an algorithm where if you if you only had a thousand followers, which is a lot for some people, but if you had a thousand followers and somehow that was expanding to ten thousand people passing around tweets of your group, you got extra points in this thing. And we did a list of 150 top influencers who were getting a lot of bang for their buck as tweeters. And it revealed all these people we'd never heard of before who wound up after Trump was elected being revealed as these heartland influencers for Trump and people who were very active in that world who the elite media that we were connected to didn't know about. And the Wall Street Journal did a whole story about our list because it was like, wow. We'd never heard of those people until they appeared on that list, and now they're all over the TV every day because suddenly we care about the MAGA. So that's an example of developing a tool to run on itself. Yeah, uh, sorry, Tamara. Hi, uh, yeah. thank you very much. I have a question about transit outside the because. I think one outcome of first class exposed the system is that it doesn't advocate for polarization, but it allows for a larger conversation. He had that analogy about wars and as well. But technically, in a first class exposed system, you are only represented if you can, you will not represent. So, I was just wondering about the intuition of translating these analyses to uh, different public systems instead of like German, or even all the public society, how do you see these discourses by that particular scale of Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we're going to have to learn as we go, and, and depending on the places we go next. Another place I really want to go early because they have the highest usage of social media per capita of any society in Japan. Um, and Japan, of course, is a democracy, different kind of democracy from the US, but inspired by it somewhat and, and tied to it somewhat. Um, but they also have these platforms that are really native to that country and that don't have a lot of uptake elsewhere. And it could be interesting to see if the platforms themselves have evolved in a way that somehow be explained by the political system. Um, so things like that, I think, would be very interesting. You know, we can't take on too many countries early on. We won't have the resources, but if we get momentum, I'm really eager to look at questions exactly like that. And of course, when we do Spanish, there's so many Latin American countries that are so different from each other. If we do Spanish early on, there'll be a chance. Thank you for pointing. So we're going to have to take the other questions afterwards offline because we've reached the the end of the hour and I just want to oh, like officially end it okay thank uh Bill for being with us and sharing these interesting things uh which come from real experience the fact that you're actual journalist and an actual you know 
uh, newspaper really makes a difference because there's so much, so many technical scientists want to help, you know, fix journalism and fix you know public discourse, and they never they don't know how it actually works. Um, so it's very valuable for us to, to get you. The nice thing about journalists is they're willing to take on any topic they don't know anything about, just like try and learn it really fast. So that's yes. part of it. So anyway, thank you all. Thank you.